All right, so <laughs> it's gonna be quite a quite a night, quite a quite a chunk to go through. Right, one of my some of my favorite chapters in all of the Bible, including Genesis 19. <laughs> Uh, you know, infamously, you may have heard this before, but uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote his own version of the Bible. And he took a pair of scissors, essentially, to the Bible and cut out passages that were irrelevant, we do to, that. Him, that were irrelevant to him and things that um, didn't include miracles and just kind of leveled the playing field. And it's, you can actually look it up. It's online, the Jefferson Bible. And if you are like me, and maybe like Thomas Jefferson to some degree, you would come to a chapter like Genesis 19, and you would prefer to bring out a pair of scissors. <laughs> uh, but instead, uh, what I'd like us to do as we go into God's Word, is that I'd like us to put the scissors away and bring out a magnifying glass. And ask God, all right, Lord, what do you have to show me about you? Because if I go in there and thinking about me, I'm going to be disgusted, horrified, bored, and um, maybe get scissors and just... Forget this chapter ever existed, especially that ending part. So uh, I want to encourage you to continue with your studies. I, I hear from you and you're doing great and I love the growth that I'm seeing and how you engage well. I want you to not only engage here well, but as you go to your churches, some of you attend here, some of you attend elsewhere, and I want us to continue to develop that, that discernment. And as we hear pastors teach at our churches and on radio, I want us to listen for discernment. And I want us to also be thinking about that in terms of the kind of music that we bring into our life, even the worship music, and have a, have a really good discerning spirit when it comes to that. Because if, if, if God's word is true, and it is, then even the worship should be biblically sound and accurate. So I want us to listen and worship and praise God and engage with one another with that discernment. Is what I'm saying true? Is what I'm saying reflecting you, God? Am I bearing your name well? Um, I'd also like to encourage you as you go, at, before you begin this next lesson, lesson eight, I want to encourage you to consider reading back through, get a running start, and read back through Genesis 19 to 23, what you've just studied, and uh, read it now with your group's discussion in mind. What did you learn from each other? And you went, oh, that's a good way to say that. Go back now and think about it again. Uh, what, what you hear tonight in my message, what what you're going to go back to and reread it and then take a flying leap as you jump into lesson uh, lesson eight. So we're going to approach this passage tonight with a magnifying glass instead of a pair of scissors, right? And I'm going to just kind of breeze through uh, the opening kind of give us a summary review. We're going to be in chapter 19 through 23 again, and this is a review of lesson seven. So get ready, take notes, have fun, let's go. <laughs> So um, God sets out toward Sodom and Gomorrah with these two angels, and he's just finished this conversation, this haggling, really, with Abraham. And Abraham um, haggles him down to 10 people. Save the city for 10 people. We know later, there are not even 10 people. And uh, so he has these two angels. They, they're the ones that actually enter in uh, to the city of Sodom by the gate. And Lot's there. Lot greets him at the gate, and we learn through our study. I know, right? <laughs> I love whatever they're doing out there. It sounds great. Um, Lot greets them at the city gate, and you learn through your study that that was significant. That meant that Lot has moved from just being a sojourner to becoming um, a, some kind of an official uh, of, of importance there in this area. And um, they want to go in, into the public square, um, but he encourages them to come into his own home. He offers them shelter. He offers them protection. And in contrast to the people of the city who are, have nothing good intended at all for them. In this way, Lot is really similar to Abraham and not as extravagant, but we see, we start, start to see these parallels. And as you study and are a good student of the word, I want you to start learning to do that. Like, hey, I think I've heard something similar to this before. We're going to get two lessons from now. We're going to get to this one passage. It's, we're going to reflect back to this. So I'm hoping you'll key into this. And in two lessons, lesson nine, you'll be like, wait, this is really familiar. I want you to start keying into some of those things. You know, I, I taught this chapter and all, a lot of, all of Genesis really, uh, for 10 years, I taught to fifth graders. And I remember going through um, the, some of the passages we're going to go through and, and how difficult and challenging it was to teach 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds some of these things. 
but it, it, it was a good proving ground for me to kind of get into this. And that's one of the reasons why I asked that question about how would you do this with Sunday school kids and, and work through the questions that they might end up asking. So uh, some of the ways that Abraham and Lot are similar and different, when Abraham is greeted with the angels, sees the angels, he runs to greet them. Lot just rises, the Bible says. It doesn't, there's no running. So you already feel this tethering Lot has to this city uh, because he, he, he should have bolted for those angels. He should have sensed something about them. But he's got this tether that's pulling him back. And we see that later on when he hesitates. And Abraham offers food and, and um, water. Lot doesn't do that. The food that Abraham offers... Um, actually provides a calf, a tender choice calf, uh, curds and milk, and just very, the, the lushness of 36 pounds of flour are used when, you know, when Sarah makes that, that wonderful bread. And Lot's feast, the only thing that we get about him is that he bakes un, unleavened bread, which is just like about a communion cracker. It's just nothing, <laughs> very scant, uh, very quick, and you can sense the nervousness almost, and like, oh, I better feed these guys a flour, water, chip, chop, chip, here you go, crack, you know, and that's it. Um, the big contrast is in this response to the visitors that he sees, these two men. Um, what's the purpose of Abraham's angelic visit? What, what's, what's happening there? Or they're announcing a birth, right? They, they can, they talk to him about this big promise. What's the purpose of Lot and his visit? Well, death. It's death. And so Lot insists that they stay away from the public, invites him to his home. Um, and who's the first audience? Remember, who's the first audience of this account or reading in Genesis? Who's the first one? It's Moses and his people. They're, it's being recorded for, for them. And so as you go through this, constantly remind yourself of that. And if you need to, read Exodus or go watch The Prince of Egypt or The Ten Commandments, the big movie, and, and get that in your mind. You're like, oh yeah, that's right. These people are the first ones to hear this story. And they've already heard it in oral tradition. And so Moses and the authors who are putting this account together are synthesizing it all for them to help them understand the things that are in their past. And so the people that have been rescued from Egypt they were commanded to take matzah. They were commanded to eat in haste. They, they had that little flat bread, the same type of bread that Lot makes for these angels. That's an interesting similarity. And the angel of death passes over Egypt and spares the ones who are obedient to God and annihilates the firstborn. So we have this angel death theme going on in this rescue. We've got this bread theme going on. So pay attention to those kind of parallels as you are familiar with God's word. So a lot offers bread without yeast, contrasting with Abraham's abundance of bread. In, in the Bible even says he makes it out of choice flour. Have you ever bought that red mill flour? Bob, the good, yeah, the good the flour? Good That's the kind. Like he went into Bob's red mill and got the original red mill flour. <laughs> so um, Lot tries to maintain his own virtue as a host, and he ends up in shame as a father for himself. And that's that's the, the big scope and sequence of this passage. Um, so the angels come through, the bad guys in the town, young and old, everybody. So the, the, Moses is making extreme point here. There was not a soul in that town mm -hmm. that was worthy of being yeah. saved. Young and old, everybody. And, uh, and we saw through your studies, and remember, I gave you the big tip last time. What's the best commentary you could ever read on the Old Testament? The New Good Testament. Good job. You are great students. The New Testament, and we learned from reading the Old Testament and some in the New, um, the commentary on this passage here. And he's, they say in this verse 5 here in chapter 19, bring them out so that we can take carnal knowledge of them. And so they want to have, that's euphemism for sex, um, and they want to rape these men. And a lot goes out, no, 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 don't do that and we're like right good job lot well done lot don't act so wickedly so anybody who wants to reinterpret this passage and say it's not really about that they weren't really that wasn't that bad it's like no lot himself acknowledges it's it's wicked behavior and so we're like good job a lot and then the very next verse wait what what lot <laughs> hold on you were doing great with the angels and here take my daughters it's like it wow how did that even happen and that's where we want to get our our scissors out but pay attention because moses includes this account for a reason and it's very significant and it has to do with the people of Israel and it has to do with your Messiah and my Messiah and he says don't do anything to these men they've come under the protection of my roof this is Lot saying if you mess up with these guys God's gonna take me down right so take my daughters because these then God won't smite me right out of my way they say right this man, now listen to what they say to him. They came here as a foreigner, and he did. Because Lot and Abraham split up in chapter 13. 
And remember, Lot was very intentional about this land. And that land was described as the Jordan Valley, chapter 13, verse 10, well watered everywhere. And we have a very interesting description of this land, like over and abundantly described at this moment um, in, in chapter 15, like the garden of the Lord, echoing back to Eden. That's Eden, okay? Uh, like the land of Egypt, so lush, like the Nile area, very lush. And in, in the direction of Zawar, and this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So in chapter 13, we get this kind of this foreshadowing of what's going to happen. And so Lot goes there, and he's a sojourner, and then he moves closer and closer, and now he's at the city gate. So he actually is a judge, and then they say, you dare to judge us. It's like, well, yeah, I am a judge. I am at the city gate. I have risen to this point. But isn't that what sin causes all of us to do? How dare you judge me? How dare you judge me? Even the person who has the actual right to judge you, we say, don't you judge me, you don't know me. And so that's, this is exactly what sin does in our own heart. We refuse to even receive the judgment of the people who are actually called in our life to judge us, right? So they kept pressing in on law until they're close enough to tear that door down. It's a violent scene and you can imagine it demonically charred, like clawing at the door, like a demon clawing at this door. And so the angels strike them with blindness. They were already spiritually blind. They get to be physically blind as a result of that. And it, he includes the author from the youngest to oldest, every single person. So listen, next time you read a passage in the Bible and you're like, how could God destroy those little children? From the youngest to the oldest, Let's let God be God and decide who needs to be saved and not. And so from the youngest to the oldest, they all get stricken with blindness. From the very youngest who is out there rummaging around all the way to the oldest. And we'll let God make those decisions and thank God um, he does and not us because we'd have smitten everybody else and we'd all be dead in this room at any given time. I was trying to touch your banana. She would have, you know, smited me yeah. earlier. Right? right. My <laughs> and so the angels cry out. Get your family, get everybody you can, get them out of this place. We're going to destroy it. The outcry against this place is so great before the Lord. He sent us to destroy it. Um, so he tries to warn his sons-in-law. They're like, ha, I thought you, you're joking, right? Mm -hmm. And so they don't come. And at dawn 15, verse 15, the angels hurried Lot along saying, get going, take your wife, your two daughters. Sons-in-law are not even in the picture anymore. Or you're, you will be destroyed when the city is, and the wording is judged. It's the same word that they were accusing him. I mean, you're going to judge us and, and it's like well actually no god is <laughs> and he's the ultimate and it, you are going to get judged um because remember earlier the lord had said and it's a legal term in the previous chapter when uh, abraham was going back and forth with the lord he says the outcry against the city is very great it's reached my ears it's very great the idea of outcry is actually a legal term and so sh you should be asking when you're reading things like that well who was outcrying Who's crying out? Well, not these guys. They wouldn't have been crying out. They like, they like their sinful life. Who's crying out? Who's this outcry? Is it angels? Is it, is it in the spiritual realm that the cry is going out? Uh, is it neighboring towns who are sick of the influence of this town? Is it Lot himself? And think about it, because you studied the New Testament, you already know the New Testament makes commentary on Lot. And to our shock, he's listed as righteous. righteous. And we think, how in the world is that possible? So perhaps the outcry was from Lot at the prayers of the city gate, and they reached God's ears, and, and that's why there was this back and forth there. And so we move on to verse 16 here. It says, Lot hesitated. Of course, remember, he's tethered to the city, because when you've parked it, no matter how good your associations are and your intentions are, you're parked near evil, you're tethered to that now. And you might have a missionary heart even, and some of you have even known in your own life you tried the missionary dating idea, but you get tethered to that wrong influence and, it, and you're not the one who's gonna rise them up. Uh, they're gonna end up pulling you down. That's just exactly what happens. So he's tethered back, he hesitates, but the men grab his hand because they're on a mission. They have to save Lot, all right? And you know, for good or bad, the daughters end up coming as a package deal with that. So men grab his hand and the hands of his wife and two daughters because Listen, verse 16, look at your Bible, what it says. Because the Lord had compassion on them. See, in the midst of all of this, why didn't God just smite all of them? Lot's being a complete, horrible human being in this moment. But God, in his great compassion, I'm going to preserve Lot. I made, a, I made a promise to Abraham. 
And that's going to come up in a minute. Run for your lives, the angel says. Escape to the mountain. But Lot says, no, no, I don't want to go to the mountains. Uh, I don't want to go there. I want to go to this little town. And the angels are like, very well. Okay, fine. My goodness gracious, Lot. He grants those requests to run there quickly. I can't do anything, the angel says, until you arrive there. You get yourself to Zoar. And you write your re review on Zillow later. Right? <laughs> so we see this timeline. The sun had just risen. And he reaches the land of Zoar. The Lord rains down sulfur. Sent, it, it repeats this theme. Rains down sulfur, sent down from the sky, over through those cities. Like, bam, bam, bam. Like, there's no missing this, this devastation. So we go from this land written up in chapter 13 of Genesis that's lush and green and water-like and, and Eden-like. It's described exactly like that in chapter 13 to desolate. <coughs> desolate. And, and the only smell is not of flowers, but it's of sulfur now. And it, all the inhabitants of the cities and the vegetation that grew from the ground, again, Eden-like, growing from the ground, verse 26. This has all happened. Everything's going down over there. And you and I, we would completely understand if you'd be curious, because if it was today, we'd all be with our selfies. What the heck? And we're running, right? Selfie camera, live on Facebook, and we're watching it all behind us burn, right? But Lot's wife doesn't just look back out of curiosity. She doesn't just look back like, oh my gosh, I wonder if they got my girlfriend. I really ended up hating her. Did they get her house, you know? She doesn't look back like that. She looks back what? Longingly. Ugh. So it wasn't just the looking back, it was that longing. And God knew her heart. Why? Because longing doesn't show on your face necessarily. God knows her heart. And that's why she becomes this, this pillar of salt. So Abraham gets up in the morning, goes to that place. He sees the complete desolation that God destroyed the cities, verse 29, of the region. God honored Abraham's request. He removed Lot from the midst of destruction in which he destroyed the cities. And Lot ends up afraid to live in Zoar, and he ends up in this cave instead. And verse 32, the girls, the daughters are up there with him. Everybody's, you know, everything's destroyed. Abraham's not even around. He's just up watching all this, and they move on. And they come up with this plan out of their desperation and out of their ridiculousness, silliness, because we know the world isn't completely gone, but that's all they see. And maybe through the choking of the smoke and it maybe even blocked out the sun. It was so dark and desolate and they couldn't imagine anything else. And that's the problem. What does the Bible say about the will and the love and the greatness of God? It's exceedingly abundantly above all we can ever ask or imagine, right? So they have no imagination for any of that because they're not in God. They're not with him. They're not imagining him. And so they're like, well, the only thing we can imagine is in the flesh. So let's get our dad drunk. Like, why? where in the playbook did you even come up with this crazy idea? Let's get our dad drunk so we can go to bed with him and preserve our family line through our father. Now, I want you to make, take a note right here. How many of you are with us in the Ruth study? Um, Faithless and Fearless. Um, go back to that study. Reread Ruth if you want to the next week. And I want you to reread Ruth with this chapter in mind. You are going to see so many parallels. And right here is one of them. Verse 32. Why? Because in the moment that Ruth ends up losing her husband and Naomi has no more sons to produce, she says something along these lines. I got no more sons to give you. Like, even if I had a baby right now, you'd have to wait until he could get with you and have a child. And you're thinking, that's just wrong. I mean, a cougar, I get that, but like, this is like, this is but that you have to understand the ancient Near East mindset. And so in a sense, they're trying to kind of jump through that hoop. Like, well, if you know, our mom was here, they could have a baby and then we could marry the brother. But mom's not even here, dang it, turned into a salt. Now I got these little salt and pepper shakers. Have you ever seen those before? We got like little uh, Lot and his wife salt and pepper shakers. They actually make those. You can go online and buy them, it's oh crazy. My. Of course, Lot's <laughs> wife is the salt, you know, and that's funny. <laughs> anyway, so, <laughs> so they go through this whole, this is a very cultural thing, but it's, it's, they've even, they've even screwed culture up, like, pardon the pun, but they have, and they, they, they mess even just with what's normal, because that wasn't normal, and they want to pre preserve the family line through the father, and, and they do, their plan succeeds. Why doesn't God stop? That's a disgusting plan. Why didn't God stop that plan? He could have. Who opens and closes wombs? Mm -hmm. Huh. What? <laughs> Sarah is barren and these two get to have a baby on the first shot with their dad? Wow. And they come up with a boy first? They didn't come up with a girl first? Wow, God. Hey, stop and think about these types of things. Also stop and think about the fact that nobody who plays an important role in all of history in the time of the Bible dies a tragic, sudden, accidental death. 
God preserves the line all the way through, and that's what we have to keep our eye on is that prize. Because in Genesis 3, God said it was coming. And so as soon as he starts moving his plan through, he's like, I'm preserving the line, I'm preserving the line, and he narrows it down to we got to Abraham, and now we're moving into this. And the older daughter gives birth to a son and names him Moab. And if you remember our Hebrew study from last week, our last lesson, you might hear the Ab sound. What does Ab mean? Do you remember? It's father. Ab, Abba. Remember? Father. So her, she names him of my father. She gives him a name that rightly indicates what she's done. I got this from of my father. He's the ancestor of the Moabites to this day. Remember who... Moses' audience is, is these Israelites, and, and they've dealt with the Moabites as they were trying to get out of Egypt. And the younger daughter also gave birth to a son, named him Ben, which means son and Ami, people, son of my people, right? So we've got this, the rightly, you know, the one who did it first, uh, my father, and then this is my people, son of my people, and he's the ancestor of the Ammonites today. Now listen, mm -hmm. thoughts on Lot. I want to just have you think about this on him. Think of Lot as this weird, crazy twisted literally roller coaster like he's good he's hanging out with abraham good job lot he splits with abraham takes us to their land okay what well, you know abraham lets you do that um and then he's horrific and then he protects the angels and then he's gets drunk and he's just this life going back and forth and in the end of all of that lots declared righteous and we just look at it and go how is that possible how is that possible? If the, old, the New Testament wasn't there with those verses saying that Lot was declared righteous, wouldn't you just be like, well, too bad for Lot. He's in hell. But he's not. He's going to be at the wedding feast of the Lamb in heaven. His name is in the book of life. Right? And you know what? More often than I'd like to admit, <laughs> I act like Lot. I'm troubled by the sin that I see around me in the world. Because that's exactly what the Bible says about Lot. His righteous cry was about the sin that was around him in the world. He's troubled by all of that. But I end up responding to the sin that I see the same way that Lot did, by sinning myself, right? And my guess is a lot of us as Christians have that same type of experience. But like Lot, guess what? I've been declared righteous. Not because of what I've done, <laughs> but because of what Christ did for me. And at the end of all the days, I'm going to be declared righteous because I'm united with the only and true righteous one. No person, no one is declared righteous apart from Christ. No one, not Lot and not Abraham either. All of us who are in him are declared righteous along with Lot as well as with Abraham. Right? So remember, God and his love not only redeems but he redeems our misconstrued ideas of love. Lot's misplaced love of the land, of earthly things, Sodom's lustful love of itself, Lot's daughters' twisted love of themselves, their lack of respectful love of their father, each of these left nothing but destruction and death for everybody that was involved but God. Because, and this is why I referenced the story of Ruth, if you read to the end of Judges and the time the Judges ends and the book of Ruth takes over and that whole story begins, the only reason why that story of Ruth is told is so we can remember an amazing story of a Moabite. And that was Ruth. Because the book of Ruth goes over and over and over again to remind us that she was a Moabite. In fact, most of the times that being a Moabite is ever quoted is it actually in the book of Ruth. It's like they went out of their way to remind us that connection from that to Lot. And God used Ruth because she ends up marrying Boaz in the story. And this descendant of this cursed line, that cursed line, listen, of Moab, listen, so cursed was it that when God instructed his people, he says, to the 10th generation, you're to have nothing mm -hmm. to do with them. You know what? Normally, God said, anyone who wants to come in, get circumcised and bring them in. God says of the Moabites, you're not even allowed to circumcise them and bring them in. If they ask, they can't come in. 10 generations are going to get punished for the wickedness they do. Guess what generation Ruth is in? You would think the 11th. She's actually in the 10th. She's in the 10th generation. She shouldn't even been allowed in. But she gets grafted in, and she's brought in. She ends up marrying Boaz. 
that cursed lineage through her to Boaz. And God uses her, and she ends up becoming the great-grandmother of Solomon. And Solomon and her line brings us Jesus Christ. So Jesus himself is from this disgusting union line with Lot. <laughs> it's all pulled together. Because none of us can ever say, it was my righteousness. Right? It's all his. So we move to chapter 20, and we get this interesting story again with Abimelech. Same song, different verse, basically. God appears, and he, Abraham says, she's my sister, and Abimelech takes her. God appears to Abimelech, says, hey, don't touch her. Abimelech had not gone near her. The Lord says, verse 4 of tw chapter 20, would you really slaughter an innocent nation? Listen. No, he wouldn't. He just literally proved that he wouldn't. Lot was rescued out. But word's gotten out. Everyone knows that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And so Abimelech makes mention of it in passing right here. He says, verse 4, would you really slaughter an innocent nation? Rhetorical. No, of course he wouldn't. And he makes the case that he's innocent. And he is innocent because God himself acknowledges that. I know you've done this with a clear conscience. I've kept you from sinning against mm -hmm. Sarah. Mm -hmm. I've kept you from sinning against Abraham. I've kept you from sinning against me. Because that's what all sin is. Well, you've harmed your neighbor, you've harmed your friend, you've harmed your spouse, but you've harmed God Almighty. That's who all sin is against. I've kept you from that. You get Abraham back involved. He's a prophet. He'll pray for you. He's going to make this right. And we're like, Abraham is a prophet? Oh, interesting. Well, yeah, he is. Why? Because Abraham's already acted like a prophet when he interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah. He's a prophet. So uh, he does. Abraham prays. Abimelech says to him, verse 15, this on lands before you, live wherever you please. Abraham prays to God. God heals Abimelech as well as his wife because God has shut all their wombs. And then we get to this beautiful chapter 21. So the Lord visits Sarah, just as he had said he would. Um, and Sarah becomes pregnant. And of course, this was that angelic visit from before that was pr promised. And verse 3, Abraham names his son. Isaac, we know this because of the laughter involved and all of that. It's a beautiful reminder of God's promise. Sarah noticed the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, the son of Hagar, had born to Abraham mocking. Right? The word is only actually used twice in, in all the Old Testament. Twice. And it's going to come up the next time in Lesson 8. I'll give a little bonus prize to anybody who can find that word and uh, message me that day when you get to it. Uh, it's only used twice in the Bible. It's used here, mocking. And uh, it's going to be coming up again in an interesting story in um, Isaac's life. So she said to Abraham, banish that slave woman and her son. And she speaks something that you think, oh, man, that's kind of rude. But you have to think about it. There's, he's at least, thir he's 13 years older, at least, maybe 14, than uh, Ishmael is 13, older than Isaac. And at this time, now three years have passed, so 33. So maybe, maybe he's 17 years old. So he's an older teen by our reckoning. And then... Uh, Isaac's a little, maybe he's a little toddler, a little three-year-old. And Ishmael is not just mocking him, because again, what's the best commentary on the Old Testament? The New Testament. The New Testament says he was being persecuted. He's being persecuted. So this teenager, young man, is persecuting the promised child. Don't do that. Don't touch the Holy One's anointed. Right? Don't do that. And so it isn't just Sarah being bratty, and she kind of is, but it's she's speaking truth here. For the son of that slave woman will not be an heir along with my son Isaac. And you can kind of see her uh, 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 thing, right? But in her sass, she's actually completely correct. The son of the slave woman is not going to be an heir. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4. And Paul uses this exact account, and he even says, hey, I'm going to use this account. I'm going to give you an allegory to help you understand it. He says, um, don't you understand the law? It was written that Abraham had two sons, verse 22, chapter 4 of Galatians one by the slave woman, other by the free woman, but one, the son by the slave woman, was born by natural descent. In other words, just by nature, it just happened. They had a baby and bam, she gets pregnant and get Ishmael. While the other, the son of the free woman, was born through the promise. In other words, God did something miraculous there and this promise was happened and she gets the son of the slave, some of the free, verse 24. These things may be treated as an allegory for these women represent two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai. Remember, this is where Moses' people are, are hearing the story reviewed as well. Bearing children for slavery, this is Hagar. Now, Hagar represents Mount Sinai and Arabia, corresponds to the present Jerusalem. In other words, the people who are rejecting the Messiah. She is in slavery with her children, but the Jerusalem above, the heavenly Jerusalem, the one that, that Abraham never gets to see, 
uh, or is longing for, I mean. Um, and she is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren woman, verse 24. But you, brothers and sisters, your children are the promise like Isaac. Just at the time, the one born by natural descent persecuted the one born according to the Spirit. So it is now. But what does Scripture say? He says, throughout the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman will not share in the inheritance with the son. So he's using Sarah's own words where she's you know, ticked off as truth. It's a, it's a moment of truth will not share the inheritance with the son of the free woman. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we're not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. And so Sarah's demand makes Abraham really sad, verse 11, because Ishmael was his son. And you can just feel that, like, that's my kid. I mean, you know, he's having a bad day. He's being a jerk here, but that's my boy. I don't want to send him away. But God's going to use this moment. This moment has to happen because of what's going to happen next. Verse 12, but God said to Abraham, don't be upset. Don't be upset. Don't be upset about the boy or your slave wife. Do all that Sarah's telling you. Remember, because he's done all that Sarah has told him before to his own demise, <laughs> right? And God's like, just do it. This one's, I'm going to, you get a pass on this one. Listen to your wife. Neck turning the head, go for it. Do it, <laughs> right? Because through Isaac, your descendants will be counted. Don't worry about Ishmael. I got a plan here. Trust me on this, God's saying. Verse 31, I will also make the son of the slave wife into a great nation, for he's your descendant too. Why? Genesis 12, 1 through 3. I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. I will make your name great, and I will make you into a great nation. So Abraham does it. He sends her away. And she went wandering aimlessly. She's out of her mind, right? Like when she escaped down to sh towards Shur to Egypt, she's out of her mind. She's going through this wilderness of Beersheba, and when the water in the skin was gone, she shoves her, his child. Remember, he's 17 years old. She sticks him under a bush. So he's not a little baby. A lot of the pictures show him as like this little kid. She sticks him under a bush. He's a, he's a man, but she pushes him under this bush anyway. She's out of her mind, right? They're out of water and out of the mind. And verse 16, she went down, sat down by herself across from him at quite a distance about a bow shot. Underline that in your Bible. About a bow shot away. Underline that. We're going to get back to that. For she thought... I refuse to watch this child die. Of course you would. Who wants to see their own child die? So she sat across from him. She weeps and controls me. But God heard the boy's voice. What does Ishmael's name mean? Ishmael. Shema, here. It means here. Hero Israel. So God hears Shema, the boy's voice. The angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and asked, What's the matter, Hagar? Hagar, what's the matter? Don't be afraid. Get up. God's heard the boy's voice right where he's crying. Get up, help the boy, hold him by the hand. I'm going to make him into a great nation. Verse 19, this is so incredible. Listen to this. God enabled Hagar to see a well of water. Lady, she was near this well of water the entire time. She was dying for no reason. There was water available to her. She didn't see it. God enabled her to see the water. But he had to have a moment with her. She had to get so desperate that she pushes her own child away and let him die without her seeing it. And he says, I got your attention now. Don't worry about this. I got you. I will make him into a great nation. Boom. Eyes are open. He sees the well. You know what this reminds me of? That in our moment of desperation, when we can't see a way out, it's God who might be closing our eyes. God's the one that opens and closes wombs. God's the one who opens and closes eyes. And her eyes are closed in this moment. And it reminds me of the time, about 5,000, 3,000 years from this moment, actually, <laughs> when a couple of men are walking on along a road and their eyes are also closed. And they're discouraged. And they're out of hope. And they thought there was a plan for them. And they were part of the promise. And they were part of the family. And everything seemed bleak. And as they're on that road to Emmaus, who appears to them? Jesus. Jesus does. Good job, ladies. <laughs> he appears to them, and he doesn't reveal himself. He lets them go on in their desperation. He starts revealing his plan to them. And they're like, yeah, okay, that's amazing. And their eyes are thinking. And he gets back to their house, and they, the moment they break the bread, their eyes are open. At the sound, the Shema, the hearing of the bread being broken. Your eyes are open. Why? Because God keeps eyes closed and God opens eyes. And ladies, in this moment of your life right now, and whatever you're going through, you might be blind to what you need to see. And perhaps this is your opportunity to plead to heaven. God, open my eyes. Are you keeping them closed? All right, if it's on you and you're keeping them closed, I'm, I'll be blind. I won't see it. 
I'll just pray to you during this time and you'll reveal yourself. But God, if you could just please open my eyes, I'd really appreciate that too. And beg God to open your eyes so that you can see what his intentions are. Because maybe you're still super focused on what your own intentions are, what you want to see. And you're, 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 you're out of ideas, you're out of desperation, just like the daughters were with Law, and uh, they're going to make love to the dad. Out of ideas. They can't imagine anything else. Hagar is too. Can't imagine anything but death. And so she just commits herself to it. And God reaches down, here's the son. Part of the promise opens her eyes and she sees. God enables her to see. God was with the boys he grew, verse 20, and he becomes a what? An archer. Huh, interesting. How far away was she from her son? A bow shot away. Hmm. I don't think anything in the Bible is by mistake. I think his father, uh, daughter, uh, son, and mother conversed about this whole moment. Remember, Mom, when I was about a bow shot away? And that just becomes part of their story. And so he's attracted to that archer life, and he becomes that. He connects with that. And he's an archer. And Moses includes this. And that's the last time we hear of Hagar. That's it. She's out of the story. And we close on this in the life of Hagar. And he finds a wife in the land of Egypt. And we move on to this next story here with Abimelech again and, and this treaty they make at Beersheba. At the end of this treaty they make and the agreement they come to, Abraham does something interesting and the author takes the time to include that it's not only a tree, verse 33, that he plants, but it's a what? A tamarisk tree. In the chapter, in the lesson coming up, you're going to read about three more trees and they're all going to be named. Pay attention to that. He could have just said a tree. And if you think about, you know, Middle East, you're going to think maybe olive tree. Maybe like Jesus talks about, like a fig tree. Those are popular back then. Yeah. A tamarisk tree. Why? Why is there a tamarisk tree? Huh, I wonder why. Abraham takes the time to plant a, not just any tree, but a tamarisk tree. Tamarisk trees are really interesting. They're very unique. But he stays there and he worships God, the eternal God, El Alam. And um, he stays in this for quite some time. But why a, why a tamarisk tree? Listen, are there any accidents in the Bible? Any words are just like thrown in there, just like salt and pepper, just shaking out here and there? No. There's a reason for that. If you understand what a tamarisk tree provides, you'll get it. Trees provide shade if they're big and huge, and tamarisk trees will do that, but they take quite a while to get large. I want you to go back to the covenant that God makes when he cuts the covenant with Abraham. And he says, how do I know what's going to be the sign of this covenant? I want to know about this land that I'm going to get. And God puts him into this deep sleep, says, go get a you know, cow and a goat and the birds and the whole nine yards, this weird ritual, and he figure eights through infinity sign, and he's asleep, and God comes to him, and you're thinking he's going to finally tell him what's going to happen, and this is all you're going to know, and he basically says this horrible news, your people, you're going to have a bunch of them, uh, but they're going to be slaves, and they're going to be in this other land that's not your own, and they're going to be enslaved for, how many years are they going to be enslaved? They're going to be enslaved for 400 years, and Abraham remembers that key point. And he's thinking about this family that he has to come, and it's going to be quite a while until that family comes along. And he knows they're going to be a slave in that land. He knows they're going to have to come back up from that land. He doesn't know how it's going to happen. God just told him it's going to happen. They're going to be there for 400 years. It didn't happen for a while. About 200 years have to go by before it does happen. You know how long it takes a Tamas crew to get to full growth? 400 years. 400 years. So by the time that tree was planted... It had fully grown. It's beyond the 400 years. It's going to be about 600 years old at that time. And it's going to provide shade at some point and a memorial for those people as they come up through Egypt. Isn't that God awesome? God's amazing. So sometime after these things, chapter 22, God tested Abraham. And aren't we relieved that God signals us at the beginning of that chapter that that's exactly why the story is going to be told? Hey, it's a test. This is going to freak you out in a minute. Wouldn't that be nice if he had said that in front of chapter 19? Hey, it's going to be really weird in a minute. Hang in there with me. <laughs> but he says, it's a, it's a test. He says, Abraham, and we get this Hinemi response. Hinemi, Abraham replies. God says, take your son, your only son, the son you love, Isaac. <laughs> Listen, pause. If Abraham hadn't sent Ishmael away, Ishmael would have been there with him. But he says, listen to your wife this time without worrying about it and get Ishmael out of the story because I'm going to move in on Isaac. Had Ishmael been there, don't you think what God's going to ask him next? Abraham would be like, well, I'll just sacrifice Ishmael. 
Three doesn't really count anyway. <laughs> right? But God already sent him away. He's too far away now. Can't go get him. Maybe he could have thought about it. So God makes it super clear so Abraham doesn't get any wild ideas of go finding Hagar and Ishmael. We're now out of the picture. So that's why that story is important. Get rid of Ishmael. Let him go. He's not part of this plan. Listen, what's the entire plan of the Bible about, ladies? Jesus. 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 And from Genesis 3 forward, we got to get that line to Jesus. Listen, your life depended on that, that Jesus would come. And you don't think Satan is moving to prevent that from coming? You don't think Satan and his minions are out there scheming and plotting to find out who's the promised one, who is the Genesis 3 answer? You don't think they are omniscient? They're out to slaughter anyone they can, corrupt anyone they can. That's just why, this is why we get Genesis chapter 6 where the angels come in and affect that line and God has to wipe them all out. This is why every time they go into battle, he's like, wipe them out because Satan's trying to corrupt the lineage. And God is over and over and over and over again on his mission to protect it, right? So he says, take your son, your only son. He's like, all right, I've been on journeys before. You told me to leave my family, you told me to get out of that land. I did that before. Take your son, your only son whom you love, go to the land of Moriah. Okay, Moriah, huh? Now, the key to this passage is to answer the question, who is Isaac? Who is Isaac? Well, Isaac's Abraham's promised offspring. He's the immediate- Hey, welcome back. I'm glad you're here. This is Jennifer, and this is the Dwelling Witchley Bible Study. This message is gonna take us through Genesis chapter 15 through 18, an amazing passage. And I'm gonna invite you to, if you are just listening to the message, to go ahead and maybe watch this one over on my YouTube channel. Uh, just go to YouTube and search Jennifer Richmond for the Genesis study. And you'll be able to catch the slides that are available to see at the, the end of the message about the 40 minute spring. mark so again it's go to the end of the lesson and uh not <laughs> ishmael Offspring. Hey, this is Jennifer, Isaac. and this is the Dwelling Witchly Bible Study. We're going through Genesis chapter 15 through 18. And today, if you're just listening to the podcast, I'm going to encourage you to hop over to YouTube and watch this video. At the 40-minute mark, I'll be introducing some slides that will be especially helpful to you to grasp the content. So hop over to YouTube and watch it again at the 40-minute mark, and I'll see you over there. And so Abraham's thinking about this, the son, the son of the promise. He says, go up to Moriah, and he's like, all right, again, I've been traveling before, and offer him up as a burnt offering. Wait, stop. <laughs> what? On one of the mountains, I'm gonna indicate to you. And up until that moment, I'm sure Abraham was like, okay, my son, my only son, yeah, I know, that's right, Ishmael's not here anymore, going to Moriah, whatever I'm gonna do up there, and then he gets to this moment. Do you think God spoke it quickly, or just so he would get it over it? Or do you think he belabored it and spoke it slowly so Abraham would really have time and the intensity would build up? Get them up there as a burnt offering. And do you think Abraham waited? Do you think he was like, I don't think I want to do this. Let me give it a week to think about it. Pull a Jonah and head the other direction, right? Nope. Verse 3, early in the morning, Abraham got up, saddled his donkey. Now, at this point right here, I want to remind you that I used to teach fifth grade, and I would tell my fifth graders the same things I'm telling you guys. It's not about you. It's about God. Look for Jesus. Look for Jesus. Look for Jesus. I always, all, all year long, you tell them that. So I'm getting to the story, and I, I know what I want them to start to see, and, and I know what I've been teaching them all year long as we get to this point of the story. And as we start reading through, I can feel like this excited, nervous energy bubbling up in the classroom of, of the kids. And as, as we move through the story, all of a sudden, one of the kids in the background hits the other girl next to her, and she's like, this is all about Jesus! <laughs> she just boards it out. I want you to have that little 10-year-old girl's heart as we read through, and I want you to listen to every single little thing that points to Jesus, because the Jews go out of their way to this day to deny that this chapter has anything to do with Jesus. Make a big point of this chapter, because we do. And they make a big point saying it's not about Jesus. Now listen, he took two of his young servants. How, how many servants? Two. Along with him and his son Isaac. When he had cut the wood for the burnt offering, he strutted out for the place God had spoken to him about on the third day. How many days? Third, third day. Days. Abraham caught sight of the place in the distance, so he's headed with servants. How many servants? Two. 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 You two stay here with a horse? Donkey. Huh, a donkey. Two donkey. servants. Interesting. And uh, go up there. We will worship, and then I will return to you. Huh? What? 
No, we will worship. We will return to you. Look for Abraham's confidence and faith throughout this entire passage. Mm -hmm. It already starts right here. Abraham took the wood for the offering, put it on his son Isaac, who couldn't have been a little kid. He's a grown man. In fact, even Jewish scholars say, doing the math on um, Sarah's death, who's going to come in a minute, um, Sarah's death, uh, and her age when she had birth, gave birth at 90 and she dies and then they do the subtraction, they figure it out and I'm not good at math, but it ends up being putting him at about 37 years old. That's Jewish reckoning. Oh. Yes. Oh. And uh, many Christian scholars think he was probably 30 to 33. Interesting, huh? 33, that would be fascinating, wouldn't it? Abraham takes the wood for the offering, puts it on his fully grown man child, <laughs> Isaac, takes the fire and the knife in his hand. Two of them walk together. Isaac said to him, my father, what is it, son? Here's the fire, here's the wood. And this is the question we all need to be asking our entire life. This is your question. If you want a life verse, this is your life verse. Verse 7, where's the lamb? You know who answered that question, where the lamb was? John did in John chapter 1. There's the lamb, behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Where's the lamb? Oh, Isaac, if you only knew. God will provide. God will provide. There's your next life verse. No matter what you're going through in your life, you want a tattoo? Put that one on. God will provide for himself. In some translations read, God will himself provide. And some translations read, God will provide himself. The Hebrew is ambiguous there. The lamb for the burnt offering, my son Abraham replied. The two of them continued on together. They came to the place God had told them about. Abraham builds the altar there, arranges the wood, ties up his son, places him on the altar. Abraham reaches out and the tension is building and it's building and it's building. You can imagine my little 10-year-old students going, this is about Jesus, this is about Jesus. And what happens to Jesus, you guys? The knife is plunged into Jesus. Jesus does die. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, stay your hand, Abraham, Abraham, Hinemi, Abraham replies, don't harm the boy. You know, God's not interested in human sacrifice. He has to be the only sacrifice. Don't do anything to him for I know that you do what? Fear God, the first thing he says, it ties it back to Psalm 103. Fear God, fear God, fear God, fear God, because you did not hold your son, your only son for me. Abraham looked up, there's the ram. There's the provision of God. He goes over, gets the ram, makes that the burnt offering instead of his son. The Lord provides, he names that place. In the mountain of the Lord, provision will be made. Where is that mountain? That's Mount Moriah. It's only mentioned twice in the entire Bible. Only two times do we even see that ever mentioned again. The next time it's mentioned is in reference, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> a little dry throat there, uh, is in reference to the temple because the temple of God where all the sacrifices are offered is built on Mount Moriah, and that's in Second Chronicles chapter three, verse one. The temple so only, Solomon built. The temple Solomon built, where all the sacrifices are offered. Mount Moriah. It's the only other time it's ever mentioned. That's the exact same place that God takes, um, provides for uh, Abraham with the ram. So he says, I solemnly swear because you've done this, you've not withheld your son. Because you've obeyed me, all the nations are going to be blessed. And he repeats the promises that he made to him. Abraham returns to his servants like he said he would. And they set out for Beersheba. Who was just in Beersheba? Hagar was. Yeah. He goes back to that land. Um, the lesson closes, our, our, our time closes with chapter 23. And I'll just briefly um, indicate what the significance of this beyond the obvious. Sarah is the only one who gets eulogized uh, like this. She's um, very highly esteemed. Um, she's of the matriarchs. We have the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we have the three matriarchs. Sarah will four, actually. And Sarah is the first of the matriarchs. And uh, she dies in that land. Abraham went there. He wasn't there. He has to go. And he goes in and weeps for her. And um, he makes this agreement with the Hittites there. A uh, Heth, they might say, but they're the Hittites. Give me ownership of a burial site among you that I may bury my dead. Listen, the only property Abraham ever owns his entire life is a burial site. It's a grave. God had promised him all along, you're going to have this entire land. It's all going to be yours. And he dies, and it's not all his. The only thing he gets his entire life, the only thing that he actually ever owns with his own money is a burial site. Why? Because the Bible says the cattle on a thousand hills belong to the Lord. The sun, the moon, everything, all of it's his, right? So God's going to get the rest of that land. Abraham gets the burial site. 
where they can memorialize and all the patriarchs, uh, male and female, except for one, and you'll find out later who that is, end up getting buried in this cave, the cave of Machpelah. And so this whole passage closes here with this amazing account. And the emphasis here is a reminder to us all that if we keep on trying to make the Bible primarily a rule book, it just will fall apart. With that kind of a mindset, Genesis 22 is scandalous. Human sacrifice? It's a barrier to faith, and it is a barrier to faith. The Jews to this day go out of their way to say Genesis 22 isn't what about what we know it is about. But when scripture is read as it is intended to see, and it's a testimony to Jesus Christ, suddenly that we realize that the Bible and all the believers in every age are fixed on one truth. And it's the truth that John proclaimed. And it's the truth that answers the question that Isaac asked. Where's the lamb? And John said, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Let's pray. Father God, your word is amazing. We're constantly reminded in our feebleness that it's you who provides and you do and you continue to provide. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for the truth of your testimony. Thank you for the joy of this fellowship that we can come together and be reminded of that truth together. Lord, continue to bless us in our study and to keep us alert and attentive to looking for you and your son and to avoiding the trap of trying to find ourselves, but to really seek you first. Bless these women as they continue now in their studies. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen.